Well, thank you all very much for uh, joining us today at the Book Fest. Uh, and for about 30 minutes ago, when I saw the sky, uh, I thought that there might be six people here. So, uh, But as we know in New Orleans, uh, the sky could change in about five minutes. So it's great to see this kind of crowd. Uh, and I, I will start by seconding uh, what Robin said. Uh, you know, these are two very compelling books. They're two important books. And uh, at times, in different ways, they're two jaw-dropping books, both on uh, what Doug's book affirms that can be done, what David's book points out, uh, the headwinds against it, to say the least, right? You know, I'd, one place I'd like to start uh, is, you know, when I, when I think about writers like this, such astonishing range, they could write about anything. And so maybe we should start by, you know, Doug, you can go first. Tell me about the choice, right? The choice to say, I'm going to devote myself to this story. What did you find compelling about it? What did you find important about it? Well, I, it's just great to be back here. And, with, and um, Robin, the provost, being so kind to us. I would have been, I used to teach at Tulane. I wish I was back. I haven't had a provost that kind that actually sells my <laughs> book for me. Thank you, sir. Thank <laughs> um, you. You know, it, it really is just my mom and dad um, were teachers. And we had a Pontiac station wagon and a 24-foot Coachman trailer. Uh, and because they were teachers, we used to be able to go around America, old-fashioned style. And we would stay at state parks, some national parks, and KOA campgrounds. And it was the most delightful uh, summer. So at an early age, I got to experience the Everglades or the Great Smoky Mountains or Grand Canyon or you know the uh, Olympic Peninsula, on and on. I did not have international travel, but I really got to see the, um, the American wonders and the beauty of our land. And so it's always um, interested me tremendously, uh, the National Parks Wildlife Refuge. If I had another life, I may have wanted to have been a wildlife biologist or zoologist because um, animal life and creatures are, are just uh, constantly are enchanting to me. I, I'm one of, I still go to zoos and places when I travel, um, even though it's, it, uh, some people think that's immature of me, like I'm a kid still. But, uh, um, and with all of our endangered species today, we just had the 50th anniversary of the Endangered Species Act, uh, December of um, 2023, just weeks ago. Um, that great progressive legislation brought into law by Lincoln, I mean Lincoln, uh, brought, brought, uh, brought into law by, um, by uh, Nixon. Nixon. And guess what the Endangered Species Act went passed by in the Senate? 93 to nothing. That's how unified the country was. And that was the era of the Clean Air Act, air, uh, of clean... Um, uh, Water Act, it was the era of creating the Appalachian Trails, Pacific Coast Trails, of wild and scenic rivers, of some dam removals. It was a um, Earth Day spirit going on. So it was, it was a kinetic energy um, of that period. Um, and, but it, it cut to the chase, when I started having three kids, it, my wife and I, three children, uh, we started going on trips around the country, too. And then I wrote a book on Theodore Roosevelt's era, which is uh, TR, Saving 234 Million Acres of Wild America. The second uh, movement was during FDR um, from 1933 to 45 with the Civilian Conservation Corps planting billions of trees and our national uh, wildlife refuges being filled in. Uh, 800 state parks FDR created, 800 in the New Deal. And I just wrote now the book that's the third wave, which happens to be the long 60s, as we call it now, about 1960 to 1973. And it has three presidents, Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon. And, but the, the real star attraction was Rachel Carson, whose book came out in uh, 1962. And Rachel Carson married old style parks, like I've been talking about, with public health and helped launch a modern environmental movement. Uh, and her focus was banning DDT, uh, which got banned in 1972. But um, nevertheless, it's much more than that, kind of the birth of organic movement, of thinking about alternative energy, et cetera, kind of exploded in the long 60s. 
And tell me a little about your story in the sense of, of what, what compelled you to make the, your choice. Uh, I just, I wanted to take the material that Doug was writing on and I wanted to give it a second half. So just, just out of affection for Doug. Um, the reason I wanted to do it is when I found out how long we've been thinking about climate change, let me ask, um, just out here in this room, when do, you, uh, when do all of you think we began being anxious about climate or began thinking about climate? When? 40s, 90s, yeah. Yes, the 1890s. And that is the reason that I, the reason that I wanted to write this book was because um, it, seemed, um, it seemed like a, like a real live Roadrunner cartoon that we were living in terms of trying to address the issue. And when you're watching a Roadrunner cartoon, the coyote can have some amazingly solid plans. He has great tech, right? He has the desire to solve this Roadrunner problem. But you know that by the end of the six and six and a half minutes that Chuck Jones will have found a way for him to run too far or not run enough and then plummet. Um, so we began, we actually, scientists began thinking about climate in the 1820s. Uh, a French mathematician named uh, Charles Fourier was wondering why the earth was warm at all because presumably sun would just bounce off the ground. And being French, what he thought was there was like a casserole lid, like a glass <laughs> casserole lid was keeping the warmth uh, preserved. And by the 1860s, 1859, the premier scientist of his time, a man named John Tyndall, thought, hey, Fourier is right, but there must be something particularly in the atmosphere that is keeping the warmth. And so he tested every gas he could think of. And uh, he thought he was going to give up the experiment, and then he tested coal gas, which was lighting all the streets. An amazing thing had happened. London was illuminated at night, so total positive. And he tested that. And carbon dioxide, which was the runoff from coal gas, was like cement for heat going back out. It would just keep it. And then 30 years after that, in uh, 1894, um, a, a Swedish scientist named Spontar Henius, he asked himself the question that we had been dealing with now for 130 years, which is, Okay, if we know that carbon dioxide is like a thermostat, they didn't have thermostats, but he was anticipating that analogy. Um, if you lower it, what would happen? And you would get ice ages. If you raised it, what would happen? And he said it would go up, the temperature would go up four or five degrees. And being from Sweden, he was really happy about that news. <laughs> and some of his scientist friends didn't want to wait the hundreds of years it would take and they were like, hey, Svante's idea is so great. Let's take some abandoned coal mines and set them on fire so that Sweden will have much better summers. Um, and then within about 30 years, you started seeing headlines all over the world. The New York Times, this would be in the middle 30s. On one side of the front page above the fold, uh, drive to close Al Capone speakeasies. And then on the right, there would be a headline this was, this was a wrong prediction on the part of the Times. Uh, Nazis promised to end attacks on Jews in the Reich. That's 1934. And then in the middle, they said uh, America in longest uh, heat spell in its history. Uh, uh, meteorologists watch a red line that has been rising for 30 years. Uh, by 1956, our, some of our best early climatologists were saying, and not, not in any other way places, not in TELUS, not in a... JAM, not in the Journal of Applied Meteorology. Roger Revell, our first real climate scientist, in Time Magazine, and it wasn't hidden in Time Magazine. The headline was, One Big Greenhouse. And it said, what he said to readers of Time Magazine was, in 50 years or so, this could have a violent effect on our climate. And then the final thing that made me want to write this book about this century and a half of missed opportunities was, uh, when you were saying that Lincoln uh, had started the, uh, the reason why uh, Doug said that is that Lincoln uh, started, of course, the National Academy of Sciences, which is an amazing organization, right? They set science policy for America and so helped set it for the planet. And in 1979, President Carter turned to the National Academy of Sciences and said, look, we've had 20 years of anxious reports on this. Is it going to happen or not? And these are America's best scientists, and they convened at his request 
for a kind of emergency session in July of 79, so a quarter of a, no, more, 44 years ago. And <coughs> the panel was run by a climate, he was a doubter in climate change, a man named Joel Charney from MIT. So this panel is called the Charney Panel. I'm almost done and I'm gonna give this back to Renee in a second, but it's a wild thing, so get ready. The Charney Panel, this is July 29th of 1979, and this is why I did my part to write a sequel to uh, Doug Spud. Um, the Charney Panel had taken care to find, quote, unbiased viewpoints on this important and much studied issue. And even just hearing that, July of 1979, climate change is both important and already much studied. They reported, quote, the conclusion of this brief but intense investigation may be comforting to scientists because they want to know that their science is right, but disturbing to policymakers. If carbon dioxide continues to increase, this study group finds no reason to doubt that climate changes will result and no reason to believe that these changes will be negligible. So we had almost a half century head start. And what have we done since then, Doug? Yeah. yeah, it's just that, you know, I've been trying to, I've been thinking about both books in concert, right? And and so one question I have for you all is that, so uh, you- I know, you, it's jaw dropping. There's no question <laughs> about it. That was, that my, my jaw was dropping over there. Uh, you know, when you read your book, you, you know, you're so thunderstruck by uh, this protagonist, Rachel Carson, right? A heroic American character. Uh, you know, publishing a book. And it just, it's sort of mind-blowing in a way, like the president's mother is giving him this book, right? And so it's inspiring to read about her legacy and her being this catalytic agent. But then I read your book, and the question that comes to mind, which I'm curious about, is that in our culture today, would a Rachel Carson stand a chance, right, in a polarized world where people have all, you know, pick your facts as you choose them. I'm curious to know, do you think a character like that stands a chance in this era where so much is polarized, divided, people have their own sets of facts? Yeah, well, um, a very important question. Keep in mind, when, by in 1960, Time Magazine's Person of the Year was scientist as a group. It was a period where people believed in the experts. And um, John F. Kennedy fell under sway to that, to MIT scientists and the like. What was remarkable about Kennedy's leadership is Rachel Carson, who from Pennsylvania, great marine biologist, wrote three beautiful, timeless masterpieces about seashores and sea life. Uh, but she started accumulating documentation about pesticides having a negative effect on flora and fauna. Uh, and we were spraying willy-nilly pesticides in World War II uh, because it killed ticks, mosquitoes, and the like. So if you were in the Pacific Theater, you don't want to have malaria. So we douse you. But a group of scientists, Barry Commoner out of Washington University, uh, in particular, started saying, no, this stuff, and, and they, without a regulatory structure, we were starting to spray it over crops. So uh, everywhere, this, this DDT poison and not applying it in the right amounts. People would just dump it. So for example, Jimmy Carter, who we mentioned the Carter years, Carter is now 99. We're hoping he turns 100 on October 1. Uh, but you realize when he grew up, um, meaning he was born in, in um, 1924, um, and by the time he went away to the Navy, by post-World War II, 46, 47, when he was in the Navy, they were spraying all sorts of chemicals in Sumter County, Georgia. Jimmy Carter's mother died of pancreatic cancer. Jimmy Carter's father died of pancreatic cancer. His sister Ruth died of pancreatic cancer. His sister Gloria died of pancreatic cancer. Brother Billy died of pancreatic cancer. It's a cancer belt. And you guys hear some parts of Louisiana called a cancer alley, you know, and it's real when you are a scientist looking at uh, how uh, the misuse of, um, of chemicals and uh, Carson just was, spoke truth to power and she, she was dying of cancer. She would die in 1964. But in 1962, 
She brought out her book first in the New Yorker excerpts and then as a book, and John F. Kennedy said, you know what, it's controversial, but we're gonna get scientific experts to make sure what Rachel Carson's saying is true. It takes a little bit of time, but lo and behold, the science community said her book's right. And out of that, she got galvanized into being a big, a big hero. And it happened to coincide, it became an era of the 1960s of not just Rachel Carson, but the birth of the Environmental Defense Fund who operates here in Louisiana. And they became, their motto was sue the bastards. <laughs> and it was the birth of environmental law in 1967. And you had a Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas prioritizing it. And there were fights for a wilderness bill of rights. And the, the thing is, DDT was killing the bald eagle, our national symbol. And so that spurred more and more interest in saving our creatures and our, our landscape and the like. So the, it becomes a movement science-based movement with bipartisan political support and a romanticized view of Ansel Adams photos or of, you know, seeing gorgeous sunsets over the Mississippi Delta, you know. But the public demanded it and the politicians listened. So you have the odd specter of Richard Nixon becoming an environmental president because the public demanded it. And he's the one who signs the EPA and puts William Ruckel's house and the like. But it wasn't because he liked the topic. Right. It was because the public, we, demanded action. And, and uh, we don't have politicians responsive to us as people now. We have them wanting money from PACs and special groups. And, and so the voice of the people are be being muted. But there will be a fourth wave revolution on climate. It's not happening today. Al Gore almost triggered one, and he was the great student of Ravel. But we're, there's a climate consciousness that's there, and a lot of college kids are really interested in doing something in high school kids. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to be able to do things. Otherwise, your flooding here in New Orleans is going to be deeply problematic. I'll, uh, I'll take the case for optimism. Uh, <laughs> David, what do you think? I mean, you know, because partly I, I'm tempted to believe that the, the, the industry in of a sort that you write about has become so strong, so prolific, that it would crush a movement like that or, or blur it to the point where it lacks, lacks power. You, you're, uh, you're suggesting that I should disagree publicly with Doug? <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do such a thing. No, um, I, uh, I think I may share Renee's sense about this. Um, and I don't think it's the politicians anymore who are. I think you guys followed the what's called the denial movement. There were about, it's a shocking thing, when, um, when one of the lead deniers was asked how many people were standing in the way of both American science and world science, how many scientists do you guys think there were on the denial side? Because it did stop our policy for about 40 years. What's your guess? Someone, just a number? <laughs> no, less, it was less than 3%, but it was about 12 people. 12 people were able, yeah, it's shocking, 12. Um, the gentleman who said this said it's a real ragtag bunch. But what it shows in a kind of negative way is it shows that one person can make a difference. Right? <laughs> Twelve people could frustrate the will of not exactly. just this continent, but all the continents. And that made me wonder how strong the will is, basically. And so I've come to think of it, especially in the last year, Doug, I'd be curious what you think about this, since there was a tremendous movement towards action at the end of the summer. And then this story seems to, uh, do you guys mind if I do a, a Greek myth analogy? Do you know how, uh, we all know how Ceres and Demeter, I'm teasing. Um, <laughs> it, it seems like uh, when, uh, during, uh, during the summer it's an issue and during every other time it's not. This room is pretty much, the warnings about what climate will change is this room is what it will be like more often than not as we get warmer. But I think a model for how we're dealing with this, I don't think it's denial anymore on the part of the scientists. I think that everyone in the country pretty much has done what's called a cost benefits analysis. And they're willing to have less good weather for the benefits that a fossil fuel based system arranges. And so I've come to think that the best, let me just finish No, no, go ahead, no, I, I wasn't And then I'll, I'll um, please deduct my time from the rest no, of no, the- No, 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 no. Because, um, but have you got the, I think the best model for what we're doing is JAWS. Have you guys seen JAWS? 
Do you remember what the mayor of Jaws says to uh, Roy Scheider and the scientist uh, Richard Dreyfuss? He says, look, Amity. So Amity is a coastal, it's a vacation area, and there's a shark circling it. And it's, the shark should be dealt with, or it should be at least acknowledged. And the mayor says, look, Amity, that's the island, it's a summer town. We need summer dollars. And we in America, or we in the, we in the developed world, we are a fossil fuel town, and we need fossil fuel dollars. We need fossil fuel conveniences. And the reason why nothing really has been done is that we had, as a fig leaf, we had the deniers to say it's their fault. That's a dead movement now. And so the reason that nothing is happening is that we've decided it's worth it not to change. Well, you know, but just to follow up on that, I'm curious what you'd think of this, right? So there's something uh, we try to reconcile uh, in the newsroom of the Times Picayune. Every summer, like there can be the slightest bit of circulation off the coast of Africa. If we write three paragraphs about that, 50,000 people will read it, right? There's such a haunting sense of, uh uh-oh, is that the one? Is that the one? Yet, in the governor's race we just had here last year, you couldn't get that issue to kind of crack the top five or so. And that's, there to me seems like there's a a paradox there. Yeah, Yeah. well, you guys do great work for a long time coming again. I think we have to separate what, what are a lot, two things going on here. One can be a conservationist who wants clean air, clean lakes, clean uh, you know um, ecosystems, but um, and then there's the climate issue. I mean, so there's a lot you can if you're an activist on the environment. There's a lot of room for you. There's all sorts. Save a bayou. Save a SV. You know, there's a lot of things. So. The reason that you stay optimist is as a professor, I don't want students that are, have an inclination to care about planet Earth and the natural world to just be downbeat. Because that what happened in the 60s and 70s when Earth Day, when Joni Mitchell singing and Marvin Gaye, Mercy Me, The Ecology, and Andy Warhol's doing Endangered Species Act, and Robert Rauschenberg jumps in, and people, you know, it's so much of kinetic activity. So parts of the role of a university now is to keep young people stimulated and interested and have fun saving the planet. Uh, That doesn't mean I'm not deeply pessimistic. It just means as a teacher, you have to lean in that way. Um, As for my, the the climate in a presidential election, 2024, is what you said. It's gonna be, we'll be lucky if it's mentioned in in, in in, in the fall. Um, And for the Democrats, they fundraise donors heavy before the big elections, and then they don't think there are enough environmental voters. So I promise you climate, it's going, it's hard. Biden's now got to go to Michigan and talk to some union people that don't like the electric vehicles because they're getting less money. Or here in Louisiana, you don't want to lose, uh, you know, extra shell money coming in, so you compromise. And it, it's not a clear space for climate right now. It's not, and Biden's done as much as he could with the Infrastructure Act, a lot of future money for climate and infrastructure, but the ardent environmentalists aren't by nights because he did something like a willow project in Alaska. So you look, and the last thing I'll say, guys, the good news is if you're a baby boomer, we did instill something. There is warnings. The fact that climate deniers have been toast. Um, the fact of the matter is that um, everybody young knows what the word ecology is. They know earth science. We, we know that uh, we have educated and seeded things. But a mass movement on something like climate when you have to be global and deal with China and India, and it seems futile and seems exhausting. And so people go for expediency often. What's going to be best for my pocketbook in this particular season? Um, so, but, but we have to keep, we are making energy improvements. I mean, the state of California, I don't know if they're gonna be able to do it, but by 2030, they're committed to not selling vehicles on fossil fuels. We'll see whether it works, but it's 2030 and uh, solar has fans and they're, you know, so eventually I envision a world where we're off of fossil fuels, but do I feel it's coming anytime real soon? No, and that would be the despairing part. David, did you, do you think the, the, the denial industry, uh, industry's maybe not the right word, I'll let you choose your own, I mean, has it 
peaked or is it still got a ways to go before, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I ask in the context a little bit of like, the book does a good job also of sort of talking about Philip Morris and how Philip Morris and the tobacco wars, in a sense, created the playbook, right? Yet uh, they lost, right? They lost big. And and so what's your sense now of like the, 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 the health and power of that sort of denial movement as compared to even 10, 20 years ago? Um. Doug, Doug was alluding to it just now. It's not, it's not a viable movement anymore. So that um, you can tell because books like ours, if they had come out seven or eight years ago, they would have been discussed a great deal on conservative talk radio and on Fox. And they are no longer disputing it. But the interesting thing that that tells me is they know they have uh, the public with them in a funny way. That we have accepted it and we've decided it's not worth it. Now, the reason why I wrote the book is just because that's a great story. It would be like if you're in a house and you can see that different parts of the house are on fire. You're like, well, I live over here and I'm, I won't deal with it. And then you come in, it's like a little bit more is on fire and you don't deal with it. What an amazing story to get to tell. Um, and it's funny as well. But what I think about is, Renee, how long have you been hearing, how long have we been hearing about the national debt as an issue? Right. And do you guys remember, it's a great way to think about climate. Um, national debt is what Reagan ran on. That's one of the ways he came in. Doug, do you remember what the accumulated national debt was in 1980, January of 81, when no. he took power? <laughs> you got, okay, it was $650 billion. That's it. For 200 and, uh, 204 years of American governance, two world wars, uh, two wars in Asia, and all we owed ourselves was $650 billion. By the time that Reagan left office, and by which I include uh, the first George Bush, 12 years later, do you guys know what the national debt was? All the money we owed ourselves? It was three trillion. So we had more than tripled it in 12 years. Do you know what it is now? We've been, you've been hearing about the debt your whole lives just the way you've been hearing about climate your whole lives. And it's a good way, thinking about them together is really useful. Um, do you know what the debt is now? $38 trillion. So it's gone from 650 billion, and that's 1979 is what, that was the same year that the National Academy of Sciences said, we have no reason to doubt that climate change will result and no reason to believe those changes will be negligible. Those, the, those things have marched together. We add another trillion dollars to our national debt every 100 days. We all agree it's serious. And deep down, we like the system the way it is. Now, again, what a great story to get to tell because that's how we live lots of our lives. But it doesn't make me especially sanguine. We like we are borrowing money from the future. And with our climate, we're borrowing weather from the future. And I think it matters, the 2024 election, because uh, if Donald Trump gets elected, it's going to be an opening up of public lands uh, like you've never seen before, national forest, mining. Um, anything that's been preserved and saved is going to have a gouge effect going on now. Uh, and so, it, 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 meaning I'm looking at, at all this hard work for 50 years people did just to get some of the basic parameters of the EPA created with the idea that the EPA could get gutted in, in half uh, before we know what, what's, um, you know what's coming upon us. On climate, you know, every president's had to deal with it. We were, we, he named with Carter, but you know, Richard Nixon had gotten a memo from um, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the great New York senator, but was working on, and Moynihan wrote a letter uh, to John Ehrlichman in the Nixon White House in 69 saying, I've talking to the scientist, and if we don't get rid of fossil fuels soon, that, that, that good, he write this is on a White House, goodbye Miami, goodbye New York. Uh, what happens to Seattle is uncertain. Daniel Patrick Moynihan, 69, you know, to, to David's point, this stuff has been known. We know what's going on, but there used to be a bipartisan effort to it. Well, where, why did that go away? It's because of the environmental movement of the 60s and 70s. By 1970, all the right was worried about is Ralph Nader, Rachel Carson, and they created, through Lewis Powell, the Powell Memo, a conservative counter because, look, if you're a corporate world and you're living at 70 and you're oil and gas, et cetera, you're seeing regulating, regulating. The feds are regulating everything. This will be socialism in America. 
So they started with Lewis Powell working for tobacco and then working with the Chamber of Commerce to start saying, let's create a Cato Institute. Let's create a Federalist Society. We're going to create our own media sphere with Fox News. We're going to take over right-wing radio. We're going to con create conservative. And they knew it's a 40 or 50-year plan. And it's come to fruition. It's two different views of the role of regulate, the role of the U.S. government to regulate, and and the it, it used to be in the 60s and 70s the progressives, if you like, the New Dealers, Great Society, Energy had even gone so far that Nixon had to bow to it. They don't have to bow to it now. There are two lobby groups. You're either Sierra Club, Green Lobby, da da da, or your oil gas lobby. And when you want to do like in Louisiana, Pelicans and oil, uh, you know, it, we all want that. But it's it's hard when energy equals jobs, and uh, and people aren't convinced on electric vehicles enough yet. But that doesn't mean they won't be in a decade from now. I just want to add something to what Doug said. And what Moynihan wrote is, this very clearly is a real problem. But the Powell memo, Lewis Powell ended up becoming a Supreme Court justice. And he wrote a memo saying, the science is going to start hammering us. We have to have a counterforce. And so you might say that denial started then. And all the big think tanks you hear about, like uh, the, uh, um, the Cato Institute. And my favorite story, this was being done so quickly, so on the fly. There were very clear deadlines. Do you guys know the group called the Heritage Foundation? Yeah. They had to have a name for that group and they couldn't find one. And the person who helped found it was walking with his wife. He was freaked out because he couldn't find a name. And he saw a sign saying, Heritage Estates, these will be built in the next two years. And he ran back and he called in and said, I have the name for this foundation. Well, so it went up and running really quickly. You know, one thing I'd like to add, you, you're talking, you mentioned the cost benefit analysis that a lot of Americans have made, the, the sense of using the debt as an example. You know, I wonder sometimes if there's a subtle new X factor. And to, to, I'm curious your perspective on this. So I'll just tell a quick personal story. So uh, before I came home to New Orleans, I was the editor of the Star Tribune in Minneapolis. And we were trying to crack the riddle as all newsrooms are, of how do you get more subscribers, particularly subscribers who are in their 30s and such, right? So we convened a group, about three dozen young professionals from across the Twin Cities. All they had in common was they didn't subscribe. So we wanted to understand how did they absorb the news? You know, what were their sources or whatever? And as part of that, we gave them a subscription. Very first meeting, uh, after they had had the subscription for a while, one person in the group, uh, reflecting other sentiment, was, was, uh, said something that was jaw-dropping to us. Uh, she said, gosh, you know, I've been reading about this series you all did on global warming's effect on Minnesota, and that story you all did last week on the threat to clean water. I didn't know you all covered the environment. <laughs> and for us, for those first 30 seconds, we're like, what are you talking about? We have three reporters covering the environment. What she discovered and what we discovered was the bubble around her was so well built, she didn't know it was a bubble because all she was getting in her Facebook feed in Google was reinforcing of some of the choices she had made. That is someone who would be very sympathetic to these points, but they didn't know what they didn't know. What do you think about that? These kind of, just the very, you know, the tech giants and how this is, Oh, I, I can't tell a better story than that. Oh. <laughs> like, that speaks for um, Ray, Ray Ipsilocuter. The, the thing speaks for itself. Um, I think it's interesting that uh, one thing about uh, counting on motivation from younger people, I don't know if you guys have felt this too, but often uh, younger people's activism on this issue is part of a larger uh, fight that tends to take place within the generations. So when they bring this up, it's often a way of their expressing their impatience with us in general. And so often it doesn't go that much farther than that. Um, and the other thing that's been interesting about this issue, and I'm curious what Doug thinks about it, is that our side has made it sound like a much more pressing emergency. And there have been deadlines throughout this period that if we don't get this solved, it's gonna be, it'll be irreversible and then people can't help but notice that they've moved it back and said, if we don't get it solved by 2012, it will be irreversible. And if we don't get solved by 2020, now all those things are true, but what's hard to explain is 
that means that what would have happened in 2070 is going to happen in 2050. So I actually think that um, the way we've communicated the issue hasn't been especially effective, but I don't know that there's a way to communicate it. What's funny is that we have a society that was warned about a problem in 1956 and was incapable of taking action on it. Now again, that's a great funny story to tell. I realized when I was writing my book, I was just writing the real life version of the novel Catch-22, and it was funnier and bleaker. Um, but you also kind of wonder, and I don't mean to say anything bad about all of us in this room, but how much longer do we deserve to, to go on when we can't solve a problem that's not that, it's wrenching, but it has to be done at some yeah, point and no think? one takes action. Um, yeah, great, but you, but, and you're, you're the, the siloing of, right. of media um, and, and really important for what we're thinking now, but here's where I, why I stay upbeat. Everybody here now, we're a selected group, but there's nobody in, except a very fringe person that doesn't want fishing to occur in Louisiana, that doesn't want the bayous, that doesn't take pride in the oysters and the shrimp, that doesn't want to have their kids breathe clean air and not be contaminated. There's a unifying factor that is much stronger than the Democrat-Republican divide or the Powell memo versus Rachel Carson federal regulation. And so what all anybody here in New Orleans does not want flooding, right? You just don't want it. And, and why, how do we fix it? How do we get money? How does it come trickle down to the neighborhoods? How do we work with groups? Uh, there'll be a people's movement when the disaster strikes, people really feel it. Uh, in California, when the wildfires come, it's when their people are get, they, you get become an activist. And it's not a, a right, left, Democrat, Republican, Trump, Biden thing. It's just like, I want my community protected and I want my kids to have, and, and my grandkids to have an abundance of our beautiful country and the beautiful world. Uh, President Obama yesterday said, you know, everybody's talking about Mars. Uh, how about we save the beautiful planet Earth? You know, it's this is where we're meant to breathe. This is where we're meant to lead. It's, and that's not a radical point. It's just a logical thing. We have to be custodians of our planet. And we're not doing a good job because we're impatient. And we've become societies of, of convenience. And everybody's guilty. There's not you did, I'm better. It's just we all have to... Uh, stick together in the coming years to make sure that our kids get this great in inheritance, that Louisiana is not denuded to the point of, uh, or flooded to the point that all the things you love about it here don't exist anymore. We have time uh, ticking away, but uh, we would gladly take a question or two if anybody uh, come, just, you know, uh, why don't you come up and, and ask your question uh, in the time we have, go ahead. Right over there. Yeah. Hi. Um, so it's really interesting that you bring up Rachel Carson because I just learned about Rachel Carson. Can you can you hear me? Does that work? Okay. It's interesting that you bring up Rachel Carson because I just learned about her this year. She just kind of kept coming up, and then I went to Woods Hole, and there was a statue, and then there was a postage stamp. And I started asking all my friends, a lot who are environmentalists, have you heard of Rachel Carson? And nobody has heard of her. Of my eight, my Age. I'm the child of baby boomers. What happened to her story? Why wasn't she taught in schools? And if she would have been taught in elementary schools, like other female heroes, Madame Cur Marie Curie or Helen Keller, would people have thought about the environment more and the chemicals in our environment? And she just, a great question. Yeah, that's one of the motivations I wrote my book, Silent Spring Revolution, is to re remind people how epic Rachel Carson is. And if you haven't read her, do it. She's one of the great thinkers. She's a brilliant pro stylist, biologist, uh, and filled with just such wisdom. And it is deeply disappointing to me that she has not been taught in schools because she be, people thought of her as a politicizing factor. In the same way, you know, some of our great writers, uh, there are only a few books that change things, like uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, Harriet Beecher Stowe, or uh, the Jungle of Upton Sinclair with meatpacking. Rachel Carson's was that. But once this fight comes in, it shifted. They, there became a demonization of Rachel Carson by Rush Limbaugh and the right 
a lot of conservative school boards were wanted her for no reason, rid of her, they were calling her all sorts of negative names. Big Chemical went on a full bore attack of the reputation of Carson. Um, so it's coming back in, uh, because of gender studies, she's coming back because of environmental classes at universities like Rice and Tulane. Um, and she's coming back, uh, but yeah, she went into a fallow period and it's deeply unfortunate. And, but her writing's timeless, and so hopefully, um, you know, we'll keep, keep encouraging people to discover her. Any questions on, go ahead, come up here. Hello, good afternoon, thank you for being here. Um, so I think you're absolutely right with what you mentioned about this, you know, it's a universal truth that everybody wants clean water, everybody wants clean air, and we should be, all be able to agree upon that. Um, but my question is about, you know, the fact that so many of those consequences have been born upon particular communities, so it's easy for other people not to see them if we're going back to, you know, even the 1930s and the um, location of chemical facilities, you know, pesticide producing facilities, dumping sites um, within segregated black neighborhoods. Um, and so some people have been advocating for this for a very long time, and it may be less immediately visible to others. How do we motivate people, other people who are not a part of those communities, to, um, to bring attention to that and to recognize that as their own fight as well? What a great question. Um, and, uh, you know, and uh, thank you. Because really asking about environmental justice issues and people like John Lewis in the 1980s made it a seminal. Uh, in my book, I interviewed John Lewis before he died and Andrew Young of the Civil Rights Movement. And Andy Young said, you know, what do you think the Montgomery bus boycott of Rosa Parks was? We don't want to sit in the back of the bus because where all the diesel fumes would come in. It's 100 degrees humidity and diesel. Uh, but we were forced to sit where the air quality wouldn't be good. Uh, look what we've done to uh, indigenous people around the country and all of their places became toxic dump zones for uranium filings, just trash heaps. Uh, wherever you find people of color or people um, underserved or, or, or people of, of in, in economic need is where we're throwing a lot of our debris of our industrial society as if those children's lives aren't as consequential as somebody in a, in a pocket of wealth is. And, and uh, I write about people like Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta and the United Farm Workers in the 60s about pesticides. And so it's ongoing, but if there's another example of when we say environmental climate justice, focusing on how to get communities um, that are underserved, uh, make sure they're not becoming health um, you know, poison zones, and it's another one of the ongoing battles. But thank you. David, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah. Um, the, th the sad thing about it is, on, on, always on these kinds of issues, the people who have made the mess will be able to avoid the consequences. So the people who have made money from it can insulate themselves from climate changes. And that's one of the things that was extremely disturbing to us when we were working on the book. That, and amusingly, in um, if you think about the, the communities where air conditioning has become just required, it's the same people who would then say we don't have to, you know, we don't have to act on this issue. So, yeah. And this is why I'm guilty because I'm wishing there's more air conditioning <laughs> right now in here. No, I'm serious. We're human. And, you know, we got to learn to we're not beat up on each other too much, but we do have a crisis, but we're going to we'll work our way through it. We have time for one more quick one. Yeah, Doug, you mentioned uh, the fourth wave, and you mentioned China, and you mentioned India. You know, it's pretty common knowledge in China there are, you know, five to ten uh, power uh, coal-burning plants are, you know, being erected every week. So my question is, do you really think we're going to gain any momentum without having China and India? It's going to be very, very hard. Um, I mean, I think that if you're looking at climate as a global phenomenon, there are these little wonderful moments. Greta came out for young people talking, and you're having you know meetings of uh, um, you know um, of, of world leaders. So it just had a, the big one in Saudi Arabia. They're all useful in some ways. Things going on, but uh, I'm where I despair is we could they, at least in the 60s and 70s we were innovating in America. We were looking at protecting of American species, American landscapes, clean air and water in North America. Global's hard, and when you have somebody as powerful as China, they're having their good 
coal heyday right now when we're looking to get rid of coal in the United States. Uh, it's tough. I think we just have to do what's best for our country and, and put America in, and, uh, and if we're going to get, let's lead the world in the clean energy revolution and let China fall behind us. It, right. it does. There's no, I, I'm in agreement with you. Um, well, thank you all very much. We have two great authors, two great books. <laughs>